forwards. Pathfinder Kingmaker is a game which doesn't just take inspiration from the classic RPGs of old, but which truly understands what it was that made them great. In an age where that understanding seems so lost in most modern RPGs, that's a truly great thing to see. But there's another side to this story. One of bugs, and I don't mean early game spider swarms. Serious technical issues cast a shadow over the game's many achievements, which is a shame because there's so much this game does achieve. This critique will provide a detailed look at both the good and the bad, but it's designed primarily for an audience who has already played the game. If you haven't played it and are instead interested in finding out if this game is for you, I recommend checking out my review, linked in the description. There will also be some spoilers, although those involving the game's final chapter and ending will be limited to the final section and will be preceded with advanced warning, so those who have played the game but might not have finished it shouldn't have anything major spoiled for them. With that said, let's start with looking at the very worst thing about this game. Pathfinder Kingmaker may have a lot of smaller issues worth pointing out, but none of them come close to the one big problem – the number of bugs in the game. What starts as a relatively smooth and polished experience ends up feeling more akin to an early access title than a finished product as you move into the game's second half, where bugs start popping up way too frequently and at times have pretty serious consequences. How much of this will be fixed in the future I really don't know, but no matter how good this game is in certain areas, it's impossible to just brush the presence of bugs away as not a big deal. It is true that the game is absolutely huge, and there's hours of mostly bug-free content before the trouble really starts. It's also true that RPGs are probably the buggiest genre out there, and most titles have their fair share of problems at launch. There may even be quite the precedent for truly great RPGs that are plagued with bugs at release. And there are a lot of companies out there who continue to release buggy RPGs, even the supposed industry juggernauts of Bioware and Bethesda still don't seem to have the budget or ability to make an RPG that really feels finished and polished at launch. But none of that excuses the problems of Pathfinder Kingmaker, and if RPGs are expected to be buggy at release, then this game goes above and beyond expectations. It also really doesn't matter how long the game is, and how much of the content might be bug free, because the game was sold as a finished product, and if the later parts are unfinished, people have a right to complain. If you pay for a finished game, you should expect to receive a finished game that is playable for its entire duration. At first, it did seem like its issues weren't so severe, and that hotfixes might save the day. But one month on, it's clear that this game's problems were more than could be ironed out with a few small patches, and those hotfixes are a whole other problem, because at times, those hotfixes seem to be doing more damage than good. For example, when patch 1.06 was released, it included a number of small fixes, but it also introduced a much more serious game-breaking bug that meant every time you load a save, all items that give certain buffs to characters are reapplied and stack on top of each other, making your party brokenly overpowered or sometimes just broken. This issue affected everyone and the patch happened on a Friday, so players had to wait until the weekend was over for it to be fixed. And when the patch to fix it was released, that patch managed to completely remove all sound from the game for Windows users. Of course, this too was quickly fixed, but those weren't isolated events. There were classic bugs like the Double Amiri that I luckily missed, but other added issues, like Jubilos losing all access to bombs, I wasn't so lucky with, and there's nothing more frustrating than seeing patches that are meant to fix the game's issues do the exact opposite. At times, watching the chaos was like a comedy of errors, except it wasn't funny, it was sad. It's clear the developers were working around the clock, doing everything they could to fix the game, but bug fixes can't be rushed out so easily, precisely because each fix can create new problems. And pushing patches out as fast as possible without any proper testing is asking for trouble. It seems clear the game needed more development time, but the reality is, once a game has been released too early, it's too late. At least the developers are continuing to support the game though. There has been a lot of positive progress made, despite some missteps over the past month, and it really does seem like one day this game will be truly finished and relatively bug-free. But who knows how far away that day is. 
As for my own experience with bugs, I was pretty lucky. I did chapters 1-4 to four soon after release and didn't encounter a single serious issue, only a few graphical glitches and some bugged feats. Then I took a break, and it was during that time that hotfixes seemed to be causing the most trouble. Afterwards I did chapter 5 without a single issue, and even chapter 6 with the infamous Pitax Wardens wasn't too bad by the time I got there. By chapter 6 I was starting to see some pretty big bugs though. At one time I couldn't leave the town square of my capital. Even loading earlier saves didn't help, although I realised how to escape eventually by using the rest function, and afterwards I never encountered the same issue again. It was also around this time that I had my first advisor bug out and become unadvanceable, and three others also became that way before the game was finally over. It made the projects tab become a complete mess, but it still didn't stop my progress. I also had at least one save become corrupted, but all that meant was that I was forced to load an autosave from a couple minutes earlier. Chapter 7 was when things got really bad. I had the Wild Energies debuff stuck on my party permanently, with no way at all to remove it, and I continued playing with that debuff affecting my party far longer than I should have. Which meant when I finally did realise it wasn't meant to be permanent, I was several hours ahead with no auto or quick saves recent enough to load, so I had to redo hours of very difficult endgame content to continue and actually finish the game. There was another important debuff in the final chapter that also bugged out on me, forcing me to reload a few times, but in the end I could finish the game and compared to other people it sounds like I had it easy. All the big problems I faced were only well over 100 hours into the game, and none of them caused me too much inconvenience, but others had it worse. And it sucks that this great RPG will be forever tainted by the reputation of bugs, but in all honesty, it's a reputation it deserves. And of course, the issue of bugs is made worse by the nature of the game's design. This is a difficult game with a lot of depth, which doesn't hold the player's hand and doesn't explain all its features very well. Those aren't necessarily bad things. They mean this game won't appeal to everyone, but this isn't a game for everyone and that's fine. The problem is that when things aren't explained very well, how do you know whether something is the way it should be because that's how the game is, or whether it's just a bug? When the game doesn't hold the player's hand, how can you be sure the problems you face are actually meant to be problems? In short, how do you know if something is a bug or a feature? This is a game that by design requires you to have a bit of faith in it. But how can you do that when bugs are so prevalent? When I kept playing with the Wild Energies debuff, I had too much faith. By assuming this was meant to be part of the challenge, I ended up wasting loads of my time, when I could have reloaded early on and spared myself hours of suffering. At the same time, I've seen loads of people online call things bugs which aren't. For example, I've seen players complain of a bug that prevents them from using spells with armor equipped on Tristan, without realizing this is part of his class. And you could say they should simply know better, but in a game with so much to know that so rarely spells things out to the player, there are many things to potentially confuse players and not knowing whether things are the result of bugs or not is a real problem. There are several things that can be so obscure that it makes complete sense to wonder if they're bugged. Take locating Armag's tomb. Finding it can be so difficult a developer had to respond on the Steam forums to confirm it's not bugged because everyone, somewhat understandably, just assumed it was. To find it you need to either complete the Kingdom event or find an out of the way world event and then you need to walk past it and pass a high DC perception check. But you're given no guidance in game and you'll probably spend a lot of time looking for it and then start to question whether it's working as intended. And not knowing whether your troubles are the result of a bug or not is frustrating. Spending time searching for something is okay, providing you can be sure the thing you're looking for actually exists. But that question of bug or feature hangs over this game like a spectre, haunting players' experiences. Take two other examples from Kingdom Management. During Knock Knock's companion quest you encounter a giant, and if you opt to spare it, it will start causing havoc in your kingdom, decreasing your stats. That's bad enough, but to get rid of it you have to successfully complete a high DC event multiple times. The game doesn't provide any indication you'll need to do this event multiple times though, so after you complete it once and the problem doesn't go away, it's understandable to panic and question whether this is how it should be or if it's just bugged. 
As Kingdom events take time to complete, in which you might continue playing while doing other things, you may find going back to a safe before you meet the giant is hours and hours ago, so it can be a pretty scary situation to find yourself in. Have faith and keep doing the event and you'll be fine though, it does go away, but having that faith is hard. However, in a similar Kingdom event, you find your realm's inhabitants being interrogated by the Order of the Rack. This drops your kingdom stats over time, and to stop it you have to go and find a specific event in your capital, but the game doesn't tell you this. So you may just assume you need to wait for the Order of the Rack to carry out its investigation, which can have devastating effects on your kingdom stats. Once you see this event doesn't seem to be ending, it might prompt you to go out and search for a solution, or you might just assume it's a bug or poor balance, and then panic. Pathfinder Kingmaker wants you to have faith in it, but bugs make this difficult, and this issue is made even worse because the game often has a deliberately punishing design. That punishing design makes bugs more stressful, and it also introduces a scenario where the player is punished not because of their own actions, but just because of the existence of bugs. Take certain feats that don't work correctly. The game has no respec feature, so if you take a feat that's bugged, you'll have to live with that, which feels pretty bad. Then there's timed events and their relationship with your kingdom. While unlikely, it is possible your kingdom can be completely destroyed. Some events can have hidden timers, and some timers can apparently be inaccurate. If a game has something as punishing as your kingdom being destroyed, which leads to a game over, the mechanics which affect this need to be working correctly. Ultimately, if a game is challenging and punishing, it also has to be fair, and there's nothing fair about bugs. Likewise, if a game doesn't hold the player's hand and wants the player to work things out themselves, the player needs to have faith the game is working as intended, as bugs undermine that faith. So the already big problem of bugs is exacerbated by the game's design, which is a shame because that more hardcore design is not a bad thing in itself, and it is still a part of the game's appeal, but the bugs need to be fixed, and we can only hope in time they will be. Bugs aren't the only clear issue this game has though. There's also two other big issues, lack of quality of life features, and the load times. Load times can vary from pretty bad to somewhat okay if you have an SSD, however load times seem to increase as the game goes on. This might be the result of patches, but it seems more likely it's either the result of having too many save files, or from items in the game's world not despawning. Either way, load times are a problem, which the game's design again makes worse. Even if your load times aren't that long, this game has way too many loading screens, particularly once you unlock Kingdom Management, and in such a long game the amount of load screens you'll have to sit through gets very tedious by the time your adventure's finished. Lack of quality of life features is slightly more complicated, but by far the biggest feature missing is the ability to speed up time. Walking across maps is slow, and sometimes you have to do it a lot. Some maps only have one exit even, as if the game is just trying to waste even more of your time. But the slow walking is at its most annoying when it comes to traversing your capital, something you do all the time thanks to Kingdom Management sending you to your throne room non-stop. Here, slow walking combines with multiple load screens to make for the ultimate test of your patience, and it's also here you'll find yourself asking the same question as everyone else who plays this game. Why is there no shortcut out of the throne room? It seems so obvious, and this small addition would do wonders at speeding up the already quite tedious kingdom management sections. And for that matter, it would also be great to be able to buy build points on the kingdom management screen, rather than having to go all the way to a merchant. These things alone would help alleviate the problem of no speed up function and slow load times. It'd also be nice to move from one place to another on the world map quicker. Travelling to one remote corner of the map for one small side quest is more annoying than it needs to be. And there's other quality of life features that should be added. For example, keybinds for stealth and player AI. There are so many things that can be bound, but two of the most useful things you might want to toggle can't be which is frustrating. I also don't understand why there's no console command function. It seems like it could have been a really useful thing in a game so big and buggy. Then, there are quality of life features that are more controversial. The largest of these is the ability to respec characters. Some players don't want this included, as it goes against the pen and paper design, and the idea that choices should matter and players should live with the consequences. However, some feats are bugged, 
and new players can easily make big mistakes when leveling up, and both of these can be very punishing. In pen and paper, if a player creates a bad character or takes useless feats, the DM will likely make sure they understand their choice. But there's no DM in game, and the game itself certainly doesn't do a good job at helping new players. Then there are issues like weapon feats for weapons barely in the game, which is again unfair. I think ultimately the game would benefit from a limited respec option, like being able to redo level ups at the cost of in-game money and time, although not allowing the player to change which class they choose to level up in, or just allowing players to retrain individual feats. This way the problems of no respecking could be addressed without going too far and including a free respec option that could be abused. Of course, the issue of whether respecking should be allowed raises the question of what quality of life features shouldn't be included. Not everything that makes life easier in game necessarily makes the game better. It's the age old question of whether fast travel is a good thing in open world games. The answer depends on the player, but it's clear quality of life features can go too far, to the point where they undermine the experience. One hotfix already included alignment changing scrolls. This may have been necessary because of bugs, but if that's the case it's the bugs that should be fixed, because a quality of life feature that completely undermines one important aspect of the game is exactly the type of thing that shouldn't be added. Alignment choices are telegraphed by default, so if a player changes their own alignment through their own actions, they should work to change it back in game naturally, or live with the consequences. So while the game could greatly benefit from addressing the problem of long load screens and wasted time walking across the map or leaving your capital, adding quality of life features should be done carefully and not every suggestion is necessarily an improvement. Once upon a time, role playing video games tried to emulate traditional role playing in their design and philosophy. But somewhere along the way things changed, and the genre went in a very different direction. The dream to take the tabletop roleplaying experience and recreate it in video game form seemed to become a dream of the past, but not anymore. Pathfinder Kingmaker is a true attempt to simulate its tabletop namesake and recreate its complicated rule set faithfully. Where games like Pillars of Eternity or Divinity Original Sin have been heavily inspired by classic RPGs, they haven't tried to recreate them. Instead, they've wanted to be their own thing, to be some blend between old and new to modernise the CRPG genre. Pillars of Eternity itself shunned D&D 3rd edition as being inappropriate to base a video game off of. In the developers own words, they wanted to make something better, they wanted to innovate, they wanted to modernise. But that's not Kingmaker. I'm not sure how many games have called themselves a spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate over the years. It seems the trend was started with Dragon Age Origins and this phrase is still being invoked any time a CRPG Kickstarter rolls around. But none of these attempts have come close to being as successful as Pathfinder Kingmaker at recreating the same feel or embodying the same philosophy. And perhaps it's because all these spiritual successors have seen themselves as just that. Successors. Whereas Pathfinder Kingmaker feels less like a successor and more like a brother to the Infinity Engine games. It's not trying to succeed them so much as to stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and in a lot of ways that's a beautiful thing to see. Kingmaker is an RPG that's not ashamed of seeming old school. It's proud of it. It doesn't care about holding the player's hand, even if that's what all games are expected to do these days. It's not concerned with teaching the player all its rules. It happily places the burden of learning on the player. It understands how overcoming a challenging fight, or finding an overpowered piece of loot feels good, even if it comes at the detriment of balance. It's really not a game for everyone and that's okay, it isn't trying to be. Instead it knows exactly what it wants to be an old school CRPG that faithfully recreates the Pathfinder rule set and Kingmaker adventure path, and it succeeds at that. It is a true attempt to once more bring the tabletop experience to video games, and that in itself is a great thing worth celebrating. But it leads to an important question that needs to be asked. What ways does Pathfinder Kingmaker fail at recreating the tabletop experience? And do these failures matter? Firstly, let's address the obvious. 
One of the most important parts of tabletop is playing with other people, and Pathfinder Kingmaker is a single player game. That means right off the bat the experience will be significantly different, but in many ways that's the point of this type of RPG. In a sense, CRPGs are a single player alternative to pen and paper, and that's something that should be obvious to players going into the experience. It doesn't matter how well written an NPC companion may be, they'll never be a true replacement for an actual person. And even if the game itself can act as a competent DM, it will never have the creativity or adaptability of an actual DM. And these are things you just have to accept when playing a role-playing video game. Secondly, to me Pathfinder Kingmaker is an accurate and faithful adaptation of the rule set and adventure path it's based off, but I don't play Pathfinder or know a great deal about it. It should be acknowledged that this game isn't a perfect adaptation. There are some differences, and these differences might matter to someone with different experience. Say, someone who knows Pathfinder thoroughly. For example, the game has simplified and consolidated several skills. It's also apparently missing certain feats, and there might be differences between enemy stats. These aren't problems to me, but to some people they might be, and the differences between the game and the pen and paper are reasonable criticisms to make, considering the game has marketed itself as a faithful adaptation. Personally, I think there are valid reasons developers might have for making some small changes, for the sake of creating a better video game, but I don't really have the experience to comment on these specific changes that the game does make, so I won't, other than to acknowledge they exist and move on. However, there is one difference that seems too big to ignore, and ties into a classic debate that has raged amongst CRPG fans for years. Dungeons and & Dragons, and Pathfinder, are turn-based games. Pathfinder Kingmaker is not. It's real-time with pause, just like the Infinity Engine games it takes so much inspiration from. Some people like real-time with pause, but a lot of people don't, and considering the source material is turn-based, it's worth asking why it was changed and whether that's the right decision. This is a question that the creative director from Alcat has answered, saying that turn-based battles take a long time to play out. This means each battle needs to be unique and challenging for the time investment to feel worth it, and this can lead to the game becoming too combat-focused or lacking a varied experience. Real Time with Pause has its problems though. It can be a real visual mess when there are multiple characters doing multiple things at once, and even finding something specific in the combat log can be difficult at times. Movement in combat can also be clunky, with bad AI pathfinding exacerbating that clunkiness. In contrast, turn-based combat can seem more elegant, and offers far greater visual clarity. In a game with a lot of depth, this can help players to understand what's going on, and acts as a much better way to encourage well thought out tactical decision making that should be at the heart of a CRPG's combat system. After Divinity Original Sin, that timeless excuse that turn-based combat doesn't sell well doesn't seem to hold up anymore either, and well-executed turn-based combat might be a superior system that is also more attractive to new players. But, I have to admit, I like real-time with pause combat. It is something I grew up with, and it has a special place in my heart as a result. And I have to wonder if that's also true for the developers at Alcat, and if that's really the real reason they chose real-time over turn-based. The answer they give for why they chose real-time combat sounds reasonable, but it's not like they couldn't fix the issues raised by making less combat encounters. There is something satisfying about how real-time combat can allow you to move through easy encounters very quickly and smoothly, and the ability to pause when you like ensures you maintain a great degree of control when you actually need it. And real-time with pause combat isn't bad, but turn-based might still be the objectively better system, even if only by a small margin. And the fact that this game is based off something that actually is turn-based further calls this choice into question. But if the reason Owlcat chose to make the game real-time is because of nostalgia over the Infinity Engine games, then I can't really fault them too much because that's a reason that makes sense to me too. I'd be sad if no one made real-time with pause RPGs anymore, and there's an argument that the variety of different systems is a good thing for the genre. And those reasons are enough for me to forgive Pathfinder Kingmaker for being real-time, but they might not be for other people.
Another huge change from the tabletop game is the ability to save and load. This creates a fundamental difference from an experience where players must live with each and every choice they make, to an experience designed to allow for regular checkpoints where you always have the option to try one more time or redo something. In a game decided by dice rolls, having the ability to re-roll those dice as much as you want is a big deal, and can be a problem. In regards to combat, the ability to save is a trade-off. Combat is made less exciting by knowing you can always load, but at the same time combat is far less frustrating as you won't lose your progress. The game can also be designed to feature more challenging encounters, and there's less need for encounters to be perfectly balanced, which means there's more leeway in making them varied and fun. For permadeath to work, the entire game then has to be designed with it in mind, and this would be very limiting. It's hard to imagine this working well in a very long RPG, so the trade-off of losing some excitement to make the game less frustrating and allow the creators more freedom seems well worth it. There are some problems though. If a game is decided by dice rolls, that means RNG is unavoidable. Video games care a great deal about being fair and balanced, but tabletop usually cares more about being fun. Dice aren't always fair, but they can be fun. Take winning a fight as a result of a natural 20. When the roll of the dice is final, having the possibility of a range of unexpected results can make things more interesting. But what if you can simply re-roll the dice as much as you want? This is a problem in combat in Pathfinder Kingmaker, particularly in the early game. Things can be decided by RNG, and that can undermine the feeling that combat is tactical or that the game is fair. Because you can save and reload, RNG isn't very punishing, but using the ability to try again repeatedly, combined with combat that features dice rolls and high difficulty, can lead to situations where the player feels like they only overcome certain encounters because of getting lucky. In the early game, this can be one big crit. Later in the game, one single crit might be less impactful, but something like one important enemy failing one important saving throw can still have a huge impact. Retrying a hard fight isn't a bad thing if you're retrying to try to optimise your strategy or try new ideas out. But retrying a fight over and over until the ancient lich fails their saving throw and gets baleful polymorphed before they can cast any spells is different. It's cheap, but it can still be effective. Pen and paper is designed so you can't retry, and the RNG heavy design is there to add excitement but that excitement is diminished in a video game, and RNG can instead be frustrating. Being able to load an earlier save also completely changes how preparation for a fight works. In pen and paper, you can't be sure what's coming, but in a video game, you can. So you can take the time to buff up before pulling, as well as tailoring your buffs for the specific fight, and this tactic is incredibly effective. This can make some buff spells overpowered, like Haste, which as a level 3 spell you have access to fairly quickly, and for the rest of the game it can be used just before you pull to give you a big advantage. Other spells like Protection from Energy can be used very effectively if you know you're going to take damage from a certain type of attack. And lots of party buffs can be stacked up pre-pull in a way you could very rarely do in pen and paper games. The same is true for summon spells. And this, of course, affects difficulty. Some people have complained the game sends encounters with too high a challenge rating your way, which would never happen in pen and paper, but the game has to do this to counterbalance the player's ability to pre-buff, as well as the general ability to reload and try again. And once you start sending harder encounters at the player, you'll run into other balance problems. Enemies are too hard to hit, or they're too resistant to spells, and so on. This then makes other balance problems like making touch spells more effective, as they're a way to counter high enemy armour values. And the impact of being able to reload and try again isn't limited to combat. There are several things outside of combat which are also decided by dice rolls. Lockpicking, perception and conversation skill checks are all good examples, but also each kingdom management event is decided by the roll of the dice, and the player always has the ability to load a previous save and roll those dice as many times as they want until they get a favourable result. Succeeding at skill checks can give big XP rewards, and reloading after all failed kingdom events adds up to a huge difference over the course of the game. There's no mechanic in place to stop players doing this. 
You can usually quick save the instant before resolving each skill check or kingdom event, so even the loss of time is minimal. This goes completely against the philosophy of pen and paper, and you have to ask are those dice rolls serving their purpose? Are they simulating the real life possibility for actions to have a chance to fail, or are they just causing the players to reload a few times? I like to think of myself as a player who doesn't save scum in games very often, and I started the game with the perspective of just respecting all dice rolls and never reloading outside of combat. But it only took a couple of failed lockpick attempts for me to have second thoughts. Later on, after I heard you could get a game over from bad kingdom management, I started to reload after multiple bad event results, and I also reloaded at least a few skill checks as well. Does that mean I'm playing the game wrong? Or do the developers expect players to do this sometimes? And if they don't, and I am playing the game wrong, is that just my fault for being weak-willed? Or is it the game's fault for not enforcing its own rules better? Regardless of the answer to these questions, the ability to save and load creates a very different experience from pen and paper, and that's true both in and out of combat. It also has a big impact on balance. The reality is a video game can't perfectly recreate the tabletop experience, so perhaps the most important question is, should they even try to? Should their goal be to be as faithful to the rules as they can be? Or should it be to use the established rule set as a basis from which to build a balanced game experience from? In theory, making changes for the sake of making a better game sounds reasonable, but once you start, how do you know when to stop? These aren't easy questions to answer, but you have to commend Pathfinder Kingmaker for once more making these questions worth asking. The dream to take the tabletop role-playing experience and recreate it in video game form does seem to be alive again. Just, uh, someone make sure to tell that to Wizards of the Coast. Pathfinder Kingmaker has many of the same flaws as the old CRPGs it takes inspiration from, and you could criticise it for failing to provide many new solutions to these old problems, but that seems unfair. In truth, it doesn't need to fix the flaws of the Infinity Engine games, so long as it does justice to their strengths, and for the most part, it does. Progression is such an important part of an RPG. Whether it's XP, or loot, or skill points, as you play an RPG you level up, you get better gear, you get stronger, and you feel like you're making progress. But for progress to really mean something, for it to truly work, you need two things. Firstly, to appreciate the progress you make, and secondly, to feel you've actually earned it. Progress needs to be desirable and it needs to be deserved, and for both of these things the player needs to struggle. Whether that's from overcoming difficulty, understanding a deep rule set, or working something out on your own, your progression has to be earned. This is what Pathfinder Kingmaker understands, and it's what many modern RPGs forget. It's evident in the overall difficulty of the game, and from the fact that normal difficulty doesn't mean easy. But difficulty is customizable, and the philosophy of Pathfinder Kingmaker is more than that. You're thrown into the deep end right from the start. Before you ever get to the tutorial, you'll go through a character creation screen with enough different options and dense tooltips to make even an RPG veteran have to pay attention and think things through. Your choices in character creation are important, and they're choices that are permanent outside of completely restarting the game, so you better not make any big mistakes. And there are plenty of mistakes you could make. Not every choice is equal, or anything close to it. Some things really are far better than others. Some options are bad, and some are terrible. Sometimes the game is lacking in needed information, or it forgets to provide as many useful warnings as it perhaps could. Sometimes the player really can't be expected to know better. It's not really your fault if you choose a weapon focus for a weapon that is barely in the game, and it's certainly not your fault for choosing something that's bugged. But having such a big choice so early is great, you're introduced to a deep rule set where there's plenty to learn, and learning can be fun, and it can be rewarding. The depth of the system means there's something to master, but your choices in character creation and level up screens really do matter. So no matter what choices you make, they are your choices, and they will mean something. They will have an impact, for better or for worse. Once you're out of character creation, you'll start as level 1, and you'll increase in level slowly. 
a level 1 character is weak, and the game will make sure you know this. Your spells are basic, your attacks rarely hit, your equipment will be a poorly assembled mismatch of items, and your HP total looks like it's missing a digit from the end. So you'll struggle. Often. Even an early group of wolves can make quick work of your merry band of adventurers. You will gain XP and you will become stronger, but this process won't happen quickly, and it won't happen easily. Along the way you might encounter some high level enemies, or challenges that seem like too much, and at these times you really might have to walk away. As the game gives you freedom to explore your surroundings, you might come across fights that are too hard. If you try to fight the shambling mound near the old sycamore early in chapter 1, or the enraged owlbears at the start of chapter 2, you'll have a very rough time, but you can always remember them and come back with one or two more levels under your belt. Other challenging fights will make you wait even longer, like the were-rats that could be found in the first chapter, or the crag linorm that can be fought as early as chapter 2. These fights might be completely out of your league when you find them, but they'll give you motivation to keep earning XP, and you'll be able to come back for them... eventually. And when you do, it might surprise you just how easy they become, because each level you gain in this game means a lot. You really can feel each increase in power. Once you're 50 hours into the game, you'll be able to look back and appreciate how far you've come. You'll still find encounters with easier opponents, but where once these enemies required multiple attempts with buffs and summons and potion usage, now you'll cut through them in seconds without the need for any kind of micromanagement. And when you do, it'll feel good, because you haven't just become stronger, you've earned that increase in power. And it's not just stats that will increase. You yourself will make progress as you learn more about the game and its rules. You'll learn what spells are useful and which aren't, and you'll become well practiced at making good use of your favourites. You'll find out what feats are a must for certain builds, and you'll understand why they're so needed. The dense rule set will start to make sense to you, bit by bit, and you'll start to put your knowledge to good use, but there's so much to learn that this will be a continual process. Certain enemies will carry their own lessons. Your first encounters with wisps are designed to be hard enough without protection from energy, but they'll likely serve as a prompt for the player to learn about that spell if they didn't know about it already. And once you've been taught how useful that spell is, you'll likely find plenty of other opportunities to put it to good use. And when you fight a dungeon full of enemies that drain your character's levels, it will likely to teach you to utilise the Death Ward spell, and so on. Or maybe it won't, and instead you'll be forced to struggle and reload regularly and try to persevere some other way. Maybe you won't learn any lesson, but you'll still have to work for your progress, you'll still have to earn it, if not through knowledge then by blood, sweat and tears. And that is what Pathfinder Kingmaker is all about. It is deep, it doesn't hold your hand, it can be hard and it won't always be fair, but the result is something rewarding, and hopefully as a result, fun. Of course, it may not be that way for you. You may find the overall experience frustrating. You might complain not that the game is too hard, but instead that the game is too poorly explained, or unbalanced and unwelcoming to newcomers. And you'll be right about those things, but you're wrong if you think the game should be made differently. Games have to prioritise certain things over other things, and Pathfinder Kingmaker prioritises the sense of progression and challenge over eliminating frustration or making the experience newcomer friendly. The result is that this game gets progression right, and that this is an adventure that truly feels like an adventure, because it is exciting and dangerous, and it will test the player in a number of ways. Sense of progression isn't the only reason this adventure works so well though. It's also truly epic in size. This is a huge game, but lets you explore a huge world. There's well over 100 hours of content. It took me over 150 for a single playthrough, and there are still areas I never explored. A game isn't good simply because it's long, but length does contribute to the feeling of adventure and gives it a believable sense of scale. Also, because the game is so long, it makes its depth feel justified. If a game was very complex but only lasted 10 or 20 hours, then having to learn its rules wouldn't seem worth it. But instead its long length makes its deep systems feel worth learning. The game also takes place over a large time period of about 5 years. You'll watch the seasons change as your little barony will grow into a respectably sized kingdom, while the realm threatening events continue to come and go. You really do feel the sense of time to your journey. 
At the start of Chapter 6, you can bring up the betrayal of Tartuccio from the start of the game to King Iravetti, and Iravetti brushes it off as ancient history, something that happened years ago, and he's right. It's a strange moment because it really does feel like something that happened ages ago. You're likely around 100 hours into the game at this point, and it feels like years have actually passed. The passage of time is both very noticeable and very believable, which is something games rarely achieve. Time is an interesting thing in this game. It solves the age-old problem of main quest versus side quest urgency. When important events are underfoot, periodic negative kingdom events give you an actual incentive to tackle the main quest. You can do side activities, but you actually do have to consider how long they may take, and if they're the right thing to focus on. So for once in an RPG, the main quest has the exact level of urgency it deserves, as the passage of time is part of the game, and what you do with your time is up to you. This can lead to those periods between major events where nothing much is happening though. These are needed so the player gets a chance to relax, explore, and complete anything they may miss, but in reality they will mostly be filled up with kingdom management. And kingdom management can drag on and on. When combined with the load screens and the throne room treks, this whole section of the game can feel way too slow and boring as a result. It's also a bit disconcerting being forced to just skip forward in time with nothing happening. You do get used to it, but it's unusual to have no main quest, and the lack of story progress for months at a time makes you wonder if something went wrong, or if you're missing something that you actually need to do to progress things. Kingdom management itself is pretty mixed. It's great that it is fleshed out, and it is one of the more unique features of the game, but it doesn't feel balanced, and by the end of the game it feels like it's overstayed its welcome. It just takes up so much time for what mostly amounts to just assigning any available advisor to events, and trying to somehow find the time and build points needed to complete some of the projects. Choosing which buildings to build in towns seems interesting at first, but the impact is quite small, and considering the high cost, it barely seems worth building up towns anyway. The best part of kingdom management is probably talking to advisors when they bring you problems. Here you at least get to make slightly important decisions, which involve some choice and some role-playing, which can affect your alignment and reward different projects and buildings. I never actually saw any advisor leave, but as they are meant to be able to do so, that at least introduces an element of decision making on whether you should trust your instincts or trust your advisor. It's also good how not every choice seems to be treated as equal, and so it does matter what you choose. But still, kingdom management feels way too time consuming. I appreciate that it's not just shallow and tacked on like similar features in other games, but it still doesn't feel as rewarding or as engaging as it needs to be to justify taking up so much of the player's time. Outside of kingdom management, time also acts as an important resource to balance resting. The per rest spell system that D&D and Pathfinder use works really well at introducing an element of resource management to the game. It ensures you have to plan ahead carefully, and that you won't use the exact same strategy in every single fight, as you won't always have the same spells available to use. This system hasn't always translated well to video games, as resting is usually too easy to do. And resting in Pathfinder Kingmaker may still be too easy, but time at least provides an interesting incentive to try to limit the amount you rest. You may not be sure how long you have to complete a main story event, and if you rest after every fight, you'll run the risk of losing more kingdom stats to kingdom events. So the game at least encourages you to try to rest as little as possible. You are still allowed to rest too often though. It would have helped if camping supplies were either more expensive or heavier. As it is currently, you can easily travel around with 40 plus camping supplies at all times. And that means even in the longer dungeons you won't have to worry about running out. Which is a shame as this game has some really great dungeons, several of which will lock you in so you won't be able to leave to resupply. This can make for some really intense dungeon crawling, where the player has to do their best to defeat foes as efficiently as possible to try to both conserve spells and hit points. The problem is that you'll usually have enough supplies on you to rest as much as you want, as the game doesn't do enough to limit your camping supplies. The dungeons are still great though. They often have their own twist to make them interesting and challenging. For example, the old Sycamore Caves can be different depending on which faction you side with. The Troll's Keep is the first dungeon to lock you inside, so it might catch you woefully undersupplied. 
The womb of Lamash 2 will hit you hard with ability damage, and the tomb of Vordekai does the same with negative levels. Even if camping supplies are a bit too generous, these dungeons are still filled with enough enemies to make resource management a consideration, and overcoming them can be a lot of fun as a result. They're also filled with great loot, and itemization in general is another strength of Kingmaker. This game has loads of interesting items, and the feeling of finding useful upgrades is pretty consistent throughout the game's long length. There may be slightly too few of certain weapons before Chapter 6, and from Chapter 6 onwards the amount of plus 5 items may be a few too many and feels a bit over the top, but overall this game does loot very well. Upgrades feel big enough to be satisfying and are frequent enough to make exploring rewarding. And so Pathfinder Kingmaker does a great job at creating a sense of progression, while also featuring a great sense of scale and time. It truly captures the feeling of adventure, and by the time your journey is coming to a close, it's hard not to look back at how far you've come and how much you've achieved with a sense of real satisfaction. Pathfinder Kingmaker's story follows the adventure path it's based on closely. Its greatest strength is how well it makes the player feel personally involved in the events. As its name suggests, this is a story where you get to become the ruler of your own land, but what should be a reward ends up being more of a burden. It turns out the land you become Baron of is cursed, and you're being set up to fail by someone who pretends to be your ally. As an antagonist, the Fae are great. Their depiction as carefree, otherworldly, and full of malice feels well done, and they stand out as a more original villain than many RPGs have. However, the revelation of Nyrissa's betrayal happens too early on to have any significant impact on the player. As it's so early in the game, the surprise is lessened, and it would have worked far better if Nyrissa had continued to pretend to help the player for longer, so that when it's finally revealed that she's the cause of all your problems, it has more impact. Instead it happens so early that your problems have barely started, and so the feeling of betrayal isn't very strong. And what should have been the most important moment of the story instead feels like a quite minor event, as you won't even realise at this point that Nyrissa is the central antagonist. It just feels like one more thing to deal with. Regardless, even if Nyrissa's betrayal is handled poorly, the idea of ruling a kingdom works well. A lot of game narratives revolve around wish fulfilment, particularly with getting to be a hero and saving the day. And it's quite a common thing in games for the protagonist to get a castle or a landed title that usually has little impact other than as a shallow status symbol that ties in with the game's wish fulfillment. Kingmaker instead turns this on its head. You do get to be a hero, and over the course of the first chapter you do get to rise to the occasion and save the day. But it turns out being a hero kind of sucks, and your reward of a land to rule turns out to be a poisoned chalice. The problems start cropping up quickly and never go away, and ruling really does feel like a burden. Even the slow, cumbersome logistics of the gameplay side of things support this idea. Your carefree adventuring in the wilderness is interrupted by the need to head back to your throne room to take care of some kingdom bureaucracy. You'll also find that running a kingdom really isn't a good money maker, and instead it's very expensive. You never have enough build points, and so you'll find all your hard-earned money and loot ends up being poured into your struggling kingdom, just to keep it afloat. And your people are never happy. Your kingdom status will switch between worried, troubled, and full-blown rioting, and no matter how many problems you solve, it's never enough. With how little the game communicates to you or holds your hand, those kingdom stat-lowering events really do feel stressful, and you can feel surprisingly impotent at times. Like when the Order of the Rack is interrogating your subjects, draining your hard-earned kingdom stats in the process, and you really don't know what you can do. You have no one to turn to, no real allies, no one to ask for help. But you do know who's to blame. It's not the Order of the Rack, or Pitax, or Trolls, or whatever other thing is currently being a thorn in your side. It's Nyrissa. You were set up to fail, destined to be one more pawn in a powerful phase plans, and it sucks. When you lose either Keston or Jod to the Season of Bloom event, or when Tristan betrays you leaving you without a counsellor, these things have meaning both story-wise but also gameplay-wise. There's a narrative consistency to how story events impact the running of your kingdom, 
and how every minor problem ties into the bigger story of your kingdom's desperate struggle to survive. And so events do feel meaningful, you do feel involved, and the story does feel personal. It makes the at times quite simple and generic concepts seen in the story nevertheless come together to tell an effective tale. Each chapter can feel a little too similar, with how each one has its own side story with its own villain of the month. First the Stag Lord, then the Troll King, Vordekai, Armag, and finally Iraveti. Individually their stories are really not bad, but the familiar structure can feel a little too formulaic by the end of the game. The setting also does little to stand out. As someone not familiar with Pathfinder, Galarian really does just seem like Forgotten Realms with a few name changes. I don't dislike the Indias a setting, but the positive of it has always been to me that it's nostalgic and familiar. With Pathfinder that nostalgia and familiarity are gone, so all that's left is a generic high fantasy copy of D&D. I'm sure there are interesting things about the Pathfinder universe that fans will say make it stand out, but if that is the case, this game doesn't do a very good job at showing them to newcomers. The writing on the other hand is pretty good. Overall it's very unpretentious. There's little attempt at complicated prose or deep philosophical subjects, and that's fine. That's rarely what pen and paper D&D games are about anyway. They're usually more about adventuring and fun, and the writers of this game seem to understand that. The result is the writing can be humorous, it can be quite light-hearted, and it never feels like it's taking itself too seriously. However, it also doesn't go too far in the other direction. The humour rarely feels silly, serious moments are still made to feel serious, and witty one-liner dialogue responses aren't inserted into every single choice. Options to role-playing conversations also aren't bad. There's a good amount of choice, but it does usually just follow the D&D alignment system. Having the alignment of choices shown by default can make choosing responses feel a bit simple. However, if you were to make the alignment of conversation choices hidden, you'll likely encounter a different problem. Not every choice fits its alignment very well, and you'll definitely encounter some odd ones you might disagree with. This is partly because of limitations of the D&D alignment system. Unsurprisingly, categorising people or choices on a good-bad, lawful chaotic scale can be incredibly reductionist. The real world is more complex, and so working with the D&D alignment system can be both rigidly limiting, overly simplistic, and frustratingly vague and subjective. So these problems are present here, but they're hardly unique to Kingmaker, and it's still nice to have lots of choices that can allow for a range of good and evil actions. It's also nice that some alignment choices can lead to bad consequences. It punishes the player for simply picking the choice of their alignment every time, as opposed to actually thinking for themselves. For example, if you decide to play as a lawful good character, and then just blindly pick lawful good options, it feels fitting that this should lead you to losing out on some opportunities, and maybe even doing some things you regret. Even good alignments can at times be extremes, and there should be a price to pay for blindly following an ideology without considering circumstances. So overall alignment options are no worse than usual in an RPG, and there's at least lots of options. It's a shame there aren't more unique dialogue choices based on other factors though. Maybe Obsidian have just spoiled me, but it feels a bit disappointing how your race, class or god rarely factor into conversations, even when they might be relevant. As an Inquisitor of Abadar, I met other followers of Abadar and other gods, but only had one single chance to ever comment on it, and even then it made no difference. When you consider how many gods there are in game, maybe that's not surprising, but it still feels like a shame to me and it's a clear example of something other RPGs have done a lot better. It is nice to have regular skill checks in dialogue though, and to see the use of choose your own adventure style storybook sections. Then there's the companions, and they were probably the biggest surprise of the game for me. Initially they seem incredibly annoying and unlikable. The encyclopedic style their backstory is delivered in really doesn't help, but even their personalities seemed grating. Amiri feels like a generic strong female warrior, but worse than that, she's dumb. Valerie is some atheist edgelord who not only cannot understand why anyone likes art, but also can't understand why people worship gods, despite the fact it's a universe where gods are both real and grant people very useful powers. Harim seems nihilistic to the point of stupidity. Jubilost is a smug little prick. 
Octavia is a fot, and Econ's the worst of all of them as it seems like the writers forgot to just include his personality. But it turns out none of those descriptions are really fair, and the character development of your party members is actually really well done. In fact, the writer's entire approach to characters feels well done. Instead of trying to design characters to be deliberately likeable and interesting, they seem to instead of design them to be deliberately flawed. Initially, these characters come across as having strong and easily noticeable quirks, which makes them memorable but not likeable. Then, their quest lines are designed to make you understand and sympathise with them. And, as a result, they become genuinely likeable not because they are designed to be that way, but because you come to understand them a bit. Let me use two examples to show this. Firstly, Valerie doesn't start out as likeable, but in her quest you deal with multiple people from her past, who are all clearly less likeable, and so she seems more sympathetic. Also, her decision to leave the Order of Shellin ends up as something that makes sense to the player, and Valerie's hardline stance on the Order and her feelings about art end up being more nuanced by her questline's conclusion. Through her quest, you learn about her, and she learns about the world, and in the end she feels like a well-done character with clear and understandable strengths and flaws. For another example, look at Jubilost. At first, he's annoying because he seems both very self-centred and also an arrogant know-it-all. It turns out the reason he acts like a know-it-all is because he really does know a lot. He's lived a long time and because of bleaching he has learned and experienced many different things. He's also nowhere near as selfish as he seems, as, unless the player intervenes, when he's offered immortality he turns it down so as not to turn his back on his quest to help the gnome race. So in the end, he is very blunt, but there are worse things to be, and it's hard not to respect him a bit once you've seen the ending to his story, and know he has both good intentions and true resolve. Not every companion has such good character development, and there are no real standouts of brilliant character writing like Kreia from KOTOR or Dakon from Planescape, but overall the companions are well done. The final thing I want to talk about is the game's ending, so this seems a good time for a spoiler warning. If you haven't finished the game, the next section will spoil the ending. I'd strongly recommend not watching this final part if you haven't experienced the final chapter yourself. Instead, feel free to check the video description and skip to the conclusion. The final chapter was by far the most heavily impacted section of the game in terms of bugs for me, and it's also here that the problem of bugs versus design really shows itself the clearest. At the house at the end of time, Nyrissa separates the player from your companions, and then each companion is judged individually. It's an interesting concept, but it turns out your companions can permanently die here. So you better hope no one who matters to you has a questline that bugged out, because if they do, you'll likely have to watch them die in front of your eyes with nothing you can do about it. If bugs weren't a thing, this section would be punishing, but interesting. Maybe too punishing, but at least it's an original concept that really heightens the tension and despair before the game's final act, and I like that the game has the balls to make some of your earlier choices really matter. With bugs, it really sucks though. I lost Tristan and Demiri to what I accept is my own fault, but I lost Ekon and Knock Knock despite completing their quest in what I thought was a good ending. I'm not completely sure it's the fault of bugs, but it seems strange to me that making Knock Knock a hero guarantees his death, and other people definitely have lost companions to bugged questlines. This is made worse by the fact there's still plenty of game left to complete after this. The house at the end of time is a long and gruelling dungeon, so losing needed companions before doing a big dungeon is a problem, and the game still isn't over once you finish it. I lost so many teammates I was forced to use a companion I had never intended to use, and who I hadn't paid attention to levelling up correctly. And that's a frustrating situation to be in. I don't even mind companions dying, but I want to finish the game using my actual team, not with some poorly built substitute I'd never used before. That said, this section definitely raises the stakes. If the story's greatest strength is that it makes the player personally invested, then this section really makes you thirsty for revenge. I also like The Lantern King. Many games end with you facing down a god, but Pathfinder Kingmaker does such a great job at making you feel the heat that should come with being in that situation. The Lantern King's curse may be easy to dispel once you progress a bit further, but you don't know that at the time. 
It felt genuinely crushing to beat Narissa and think you've finally completed the game, to then find out things aren't over, there's an even more powerful foe to take down, and your kingdom is completely ruined. And then you're left with an incredibly debilitating debuff, affecting you with no way of knowing how long you'll be under its influence. And that's how it should be if you go toe to toe with a god. It shouldn't be easy, it shouldn't be fun. If you're going to defeat a god, you should have to go through hell to do so, and so Kingmaker's ending is made more effective by not giving you an easy way out. Although, there is an easy way out. A very easy way out. You can skip the showdown with Lantern King entirely if you simply agree to his terms and don't kill Nyrissa. It's cleverly handled because I'd bet almost no one will actually choose this on their first playthrough. After all the things you've been through to get here, very few players will either spare Nyrissa or spare the actual mastermind behind your hours of suffering. You're going to want revenge and the game knows this. So it sets up this choice knowingly and lets you bring your ruin down upon yourself. Of course, you can still win, you can beat a god, but it definitely isn't easy. The final boss fight is hard, way more so than anything else in the game, and it makes for a fittingly epic ending to your adventure. When the end slides play out and all your actions are recapped, it's hard not to sit back and reflect on how far you've come. Many long games can evoke that feeling of happiness and accomplishment that you've seen the game through to its end, mixed with hints of sadness and surprise that at long last it's finally over. And few games is this as true as it is for Pathfinder Kingmaker. After hours and hours of playtime, your journey has finally come to a close. And what a journey it's been, with some of the most challenging, deep and rewarding gameplay seen in an RPG for years, and a story that does a lot of things well. It was great to finally finish it, but even once the game was finished, the problems weren't over. As I got to the end of watching the closing slides play, there wasn't any credit sequence like I expected. Instead, the game took me back to the main menu, except the screen was dark, and only some of the options of the menu worked. The music cut out and immediately restarted several times, and I have no idea how the game is meant to end, but I don't think it's quite like this. At the very least, the music shouldn't cut out, and the menu should work. But whether there is a credit sequence at all, or whether there's some final scene I didn't even see, I have no idea. Checking YouTube showed me someone else uploaded their ending, which showed the same issue. But they didn't even get to see all the end slides, as the ending instead finished early for them. And that, in many ways, summarises this game. It does so many things right, and you may want so bad to love this game, but the bugs are always present, getting in the way. Even when watching the game's ending, they're still there. And maybe the bugs will only inconvenience you, or maybe they'll waste hours of your time. If you're really unlucky, they may even stop your progress entirely, or corrupt your save. Maybe one day they will all be fixed, but it doesn't look like that will be any time soon. If that day does come, Pathfinder Kingmaker might be one of the best RPGs ever made. Certainly one of the best of recent years. But until then, every bit of criticism it gets for its extensive bugs is deserved. This game shouldn't have released in this state, and as impressive as the game's huge length is, something somewhere must have went wrong. If you check the game's Kickstarter page, you can see that the game was originally meant to be 40 to 80 hours long. Instead, it's easily well over 100 hours in length. It didn't need to be so long. Nobody would have complained that a 60 to 100 hour game is too short, and a game of that size could have got the balance and bug testing it needed. This is Alcat's first game, and it's been made on a budget much smaller than certain other kickstarted RPGs. It seems inexperience and overambition may have played a part in why this happened, and in the end, it's a real shame. It's clear that so much talent and hard work has went into this game, and it's sad to think that its legacy might be so heavily tainted by bugs. But I hope the day does come when the bugs are a thing of the past, and I hope this game can be remembered for what it got right, instead of what it got wrong. Because it really does get a lot of things right. And even with all the bugs, it was still some of the most fun I've had with an RPG in years.